Okay, this is the recording for the intro to the recording for the Sabbath service for the 24th day of February, 2018. AM to the US, PM to the UK. And we're going to be streaming only on the Sabbath, live streaming only on the Sabbath service page of Facebook Live. We will have a recording in the archive on Sabbath.tv and COGTV.org. All right, let's, uh, let me lean over here and hit the go live button for Facebook Live. When it goes green, I'll say hello. Happy Sabbath. Good morning to those of you watching on the Sabbath service page of Facebook Live or in the archive. We're not streaming live on Sabbath.tv this morning because of changing our li changes that our live streaming service is making. But uh, happy Sabbath. Welcome to this Sabbath service, a.m. to the U.S., p.m. to the U.K., for this ninth day of the 12th month on God's holy sacred calendar as you can see on the Lord third it's the 24th day of February 2018 on the pagan Roman calendar on God's holy sacred calendar we're just approximately three weeks away from springtime to the first day of the first month of a brand new year and in some places we're seeing spring-like conditions but in a lot of those places, what often happens is, since it's still winter, sometimes a little cold spell will come in and turn around what it looked like the beginning of spring, uh, and we will have just a little more cold, maybe. We just have to watch and see what the weather does and what we pray about that, God, and that influences God on that, who controls the weather. But then two weeks into that first month of the brand new year, on the 14th day of the first month at evening at sunset shortly after sunset we'll have the Passover memorial that's coming up so you may want to go out and grab your box of matzahs especially if you're going to you know unleavened bread unless you're going to make your own which I don't necessarily recommend unless you're really good at that but for Passover service I'd get a if you're going to do it at home which you're welcome and encouraged to do is uh, I have a box of matzahs on hand, so when we break the bread, you've, you've got it. you got it all ready to go. All right, this morning. What are we going to do this morning? <clears throat> we, and by the way, we, I was not able to do the, uh, the Friday night Bible study last night. We didn't do one, and there were some emergencies and things I had to deal with. We were planning to. We're going to do some of the same things I would have done last night, but we're going to include um, a, t a telecast from Mr. Armstrong in which he's speaking on things that relate to where we are right now in prophecy and things we should be familiar with. You're gonna, I'm going to bring him up early. Uh, he's on the screen on the very one of the first frames before he speaks. It's kind of light because it fades up from black. And uh, uh, we're skipping the introduction. We'll go right to Mr. Armstrong speaking. But before he speaks, I, I'll show you what we're going to do uh, in more detail after he speaks. Let me switch this screen. In fact, let me switch a couple of screens here. Uh, get that so you can see that a little better. We're going to um, let me go back to the top. <clears throat> We're going to go through, I, yesterday I went through sermon after sermon Mr. Armstrong gave, and I have about a dozen in which he mentioned Billy Graham. Now, you know, Billy Graham died this week, uh, 8 a.m., which day was it, Tuesday or Wednesday this week, he died at 99 years old. Now, he had said, if you hear that I've died, when he was alive, he said, if you hear that I've died, don't believe it. Um, I'll just be in the presence of God, Billy Graham said. But now I showed a couple of scriptures that day, that evening, on World Watch. I showed a couple of scriptures from Acts 2, verses 29 and 34, that showed how even King David, a man after God's own heart, who is going to be reigning over the 12 tribes of Israel during the millennium after Christ returns, 
Those scriptures show how even King David has not yet ascended into the heavens. And um, that's Acts 2, verses 29 and 34. His sepulcher is with us to this day at the time that that uh, that was written in Acts 2. And uh, well, who was saying that? I was going to mention that, but uh, that was Peter speaking then because Peter conducted the Pentecost service overall. And it starts out in chapter 2 saying, And when the day of Pentecost well, was fully come, there was dwelling a Jew, at Jerusalem Jews, and, well, somewhere it mentions here that Peter was speaking. But Peter, verse 14, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, hearken unto my words. Um, so Peter was doing the main speaking there. And then when we get to verse 29, that was Peter saying, Men and brethren, let me speak freely unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. And his sepulcher, his tomb, is with us unto this day. And then down in verse 34, Peter, still speaking, goes on and says, For David is for David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, sit on my right hand. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, but the point there at the beginning of that verse is David is not ascended into the heavens. And... Mr. Billy Graham, neither are you, sir. Well, he's not going to hear that. He, the dead know nothing. They're in the grave awaiting a resurrection. And Billy Graham is awaiting a resurrection like many other people who will come up as in their time in the second resurrection, in the fall harvest, the big, big, great big harvest. And... Billy Graham is part of that great big harvest that's coming. Now, and but I found about at least 12 comments that Mr. Armstrong made referencing Billy Graham during one of his sermons. And I've got those. We're going to play those after Mr. Armstrong speaks. But while I was looking for that, I found a comment that he made on July 4, 1981 in a sermon uh, that was entitled HWA Herbert Armstrong Speaks to the Brethren. Uh, again, the, from a sermon he gave on July 4, 1981. And I'd, I, uh, I'd like to go ahead and mention that to you because that relates to something I've often told you about, you know, on a different Sabbath when Mr. Armstrong asked everybody to raise your hands, brethren, if you're a member of the Worldwide Church of God. Although this isn't uh, that day when he did that, it relates to it and was probably a, just weeks or maybe just a few months at most could have been a whole year but it was sometime I think this would sometime before he had everybody raise your hands if you're members of the worldwide Church of God now if the raise your hand thing was after this <clears throat> all the people that raised their hands either didn't hear that weren't there or didn't hear this that day or had forgotten what he said, or it went right over their head. But let's take a look at that before we have Mr. Armstrong speak uh, in a sermon very timely for today where we are in prophecy, and one that shows something that Billy Graham said about him that you're going to hear when we read those comments um, of Mr. Armstrong referencing Billy Graham, and one of them, he's going to reference what Billy Graham told his attorney, one of his attorneys, when he said, Mr. Armstrong knows uh, details of the Bible. And I picked a telecast this morning with Mr. Armstrong speaking, giving incredible detail and giving that detail on a subject that God revealed to us, to brethren and to mankind too, about things from the book of Revelation that <clears throat> God revealed through Mr. Armstrong and no one else. No one else has been preaching what Mr. Armstrong taught us that can be proved from the Bible about Revelation until God revealed it to men through Mr. Armstrong, which proves who God's servants are. One, that's one method, as God explains in Revelation 1, 
by which God shows who are his servants. And he showed us who is prime servant, his chief servant, his end-time apostle for these latter days during the Philadelphia and coming Laodicean era, who is end-time apostle to start all that, was and would be Herbert W. Armstrong and no one else. Um, and he tells us to remember by and through whom we learn these things. So we're going to honor that office to which God called and put Mr. Armstrong in and, and trained him for and, and filled his mind full of God's truth, to which he so lovingly shared with us. We're going to go to him in just a moment, but let me read just a couple of paragraphs uh, of what Mr. Armstrong said on July 4, 1981 about the subject that relates to when they had everybody raised their hand and said, Brethren, are you, if you're a member of the Worldwide Church of God, raise your hand. Now, come on, raise them high. You know, if you're a member of the Worldwide Church of God, let's see your hands. And so, boy, people that had raised them just a little bit, they shoved their hands up, and some who hadn't raised their hands, they said, well, I better get in on this and raise my hand too, because I don't want to be, if, if he's closing the book on members... <laughs> of the Church of God. I don't want to be left out, but he was asking specifically, were you a member of the worldwide Church of God? And so, and he may use that to make a point, and the point relates to what he said right here, where, let me go ahead and bring this in tight before, uh, so you can see it real, real good. All right, right here he says, let's get this lower, lower third out of the way. And here's, we're picking up where he said this. And in the past week, this is the past week from July 4, 1981, when he was speaking. He said, and in this past week, we've been going over a constitution and, and forming and carefully going over every line and sentence and paragraph of a constitution and bylaws of the Worldwide Church of God, an unincorporated spiritual organism, but it is organized and well organized. And then in the next paragraph he says, now, the unincorporated Worldwide Church of God does have a number of corporate entities under it, one of which is the Worldwide Church of God Incorporated, a California corporation. We are incorporated actually in a number of states, but the only members of the corporation are merely the officers of the corporation. The only members of the corporation are merely the officers, officers of the corporation, but the general laity of the church are only members of the church of God. You'll notice he's making the point here. We're not members of the worldwide church of God. We are members of the church of God. In other words, as he goes on here to say, in other words, we are all children of God, and the church's congregation is the, and that's church, which is apostrophe, yes, for those of you listening via podcast, he didn't say it plural, he said possessive, the church's congregation, singular, is the assembly, group, family, we are the begotten family of God, not yet born. All right, but the point is, and he made it more emphatically the next time he spoke, where he, would, he was pointing out that we are only members of the church of God. And then when he later spoke, he pointed out that we weren't baptized into any group or denomination or uh, organization of men. We were baptized into the body of Jesus Christ, a spiritual organism. And uh, all right, I found that while I was looking for these other <clears throat> other quotes. I'm going to just go ahead and roll that out of the way. <clears throat> that comes up again at the end, and I'll have the first of the references by Mr. Armstrong to Billy Graham, to where Mr. Armstrong, in any way at all, mentioned Billy Graham's name, and then you know said a little something about him in various uh, sermon. I've got sermon after sermon. The first one that will pop up here when we come back to this will be from a sermon he gave on December 17, 19, 
83, and uh, and you'll hear how he would make reference uh, to Mr. Armstrong. And of course, as he did it in many cases, he was saying, "Brethren, I'm speaking to you, to the church, you know, and not to the public." And Sabbath.tv is really designed not for the public, even though it's on a public medium, but most of you who tune in here are brethren wanting to observe the Sabbath. And so, and beside his comments are now out there on YouTube and all over the place that the public can access anyway. So I'm not worried about that this morning. Um, but let me switch back over to... Um, let me switch screens too because it works better on this screen over here. And we'll switch back to where we're going to start, Mr. Armstrong. We're going to go to him now. Hope everybody's well situated and ready to go. Um, with a sermon he gave, uh, well, it really was a sermon in essence, even though it was a telecast, giving details about the scarlet beast of Revelation. Let's go to that. I'll come back at the end and we'll read the comments. Uh, from a, a good dozen different sermons where he mentioned, made mention of Billy Graham. We'll give you exactly what he said. But here for us for this morning, uh, God's end time apostle covering the subject of the scarlet beast. Time is running out. Armageddon is closer day by day. Troubles, even wars between nations, are increasing all the time. The Falkland crisis and the Poland crisis. What is going to develop out of the Middle Eastern strife, out of the many other trouble spots all around the world? Just how near are we to the nuclear World War III right now? Are we living in the last days? Well, only Bible prophecies can tell you that. Bible prophecies tell you what is going to happen in general from here on out. Not the details, but in general. And we can know a great deal about it. The book of Revelation is the chief book of prophecy in the New Testament. So I would like to come now to the 17th chapter of Revelation and verse 3. So he, the angel that was revealing these things to him, carried me away in the spirit, or in vision. And incidentally, John, who wrote the revelation, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him. He sent and signified it by his, uh, signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And John wrote it. Now, he wrote what he saw in a vision. And it was all in symbol. And here is some of the vision that he wrote in the 17th chapter. So he, the angel that was revealing these things to him, carried me away in the spirit, or in vision, into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. Now that's a peculiar kind of an animal. A scarlet-colored beast, and here's a woman riding this beast. And the beast is full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now that certainly is a very peculiar type of a beast. There were ten horns on this beast. It had seven heads and ten horns. And the ten horns which thou sowest are ten kings, kings or kingdoms, which have received no kingdom as yet, that is at the time of the vision. And the vision was for the far future, in other words, it's for our day now. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings or kingdoms, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast, with this beast. They have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. They shall make war with the Lamb. Now here the Lamb is a symbol for Christ. Christ at his second coming. Now notice that they're going to make war with Christ. And the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. 
Christ has never been Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He will be the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings at the time of his second coming. And Christ's second coming is not far away now. It's within the lifetime of most of us living now. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. That is speaking there, actually, of the church. Now, that's a peculiar kind of a beast. But what do they mean by beast? And what is it a symbol of? The book of Revelation is speaking in symbols. And here it speaks of a rather weird beast. Well, that refers us immediately back to the 13th chapter of Revelation. And verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea. Now John is speaking of what he seemed to be in, in the vision. He seemed to be standing on the seashore. And he was speaking uh, really of the Mediterranean Sea. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Now this seems to be referring to the same or certainly a similar beast to that in the 17th chapter. And upon his horns, ten crowns. Now the crowns were not on the heads, the crowns are on the horns. And there were ten horns coming out of the seven heads of this beast. And upon the heads, the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Now that becomes more weird than ever. It was like a leopard. It wasn't a leopard, but it had the characteristics of a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. He had the feet of a bear, the body of a leopard, and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. You see, he wasn't like a lion, he wasn't like a bear, but he had the feet of a bear, he had the body of a leopard, and the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now you have to turn over to the 12th chapter to find out who, what the, the dragon represents. That is another symbol that represents something. And there it'll tell you the dragon is that old serpent called Satan the devil. Satan the devil gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now what do these things symbolize? Just what do they mean? Well, now we have to go back still further to understand because the Bible interprets its own symbols. And so Daniel interprets these symbols. In the seventh chapter of Daniel, we begin to find a lot more about it. So we turn immediately next back to the seventh chapter of Daniel, and that will describe this beast of the 13th chapter, beginning with the first verse. In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel, had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. He was asleep in bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. Again, this is speaking of the Mediterranean Sea and four great beasts came up out of the sea. Now, he doesn't see one beast. He sees four different beasts, you will notice, coming up out of the sea, diverse one from another. Each one was different from the other. Now, the first was like a lion, and I behold another beast, a second like a bear, and after this I beheld and Lo, another, like a leopard. Now it's beginning to resemble what we saw in the 13th chapter. The first was like a lion, the second like a bear, the third was like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and this beast had also four heads, and dominion was given unto it. Now what could this beast be? It had four heads. Well, the lion had one head, and the bear had a head, but the leopard had four heads. So now we have six heads so far, 
and dominion was given unto it. And that sounds like government. Well, let's go further and see. And after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, signified by iron, stronger than the other, and it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all of the others, different from the others. Now we read that the uh, uh, one beast had different characteristics in the 13th chapter, but we see the same things here. We see the uh, lion and the bear, the leopard, and now we see a fourth beast. And it had 10 horns. Now here are 10 horns on the fourth beast. Now the other beast didn't seem to have any horns. So we see that the 10 horns were on the fourth beast. Now next we come down to the 17th verse. These great beasts or wild animals, which are four, are, now here we begin to see what they represent. What do the beasts of symbols, what do they represent? The 13th chapter didn't tell us, the 17th chapter of Revelation didn't tell us, but here in Daniel it does tell us. They are four kings or kingdoms, are four kings, and it's, as we'll see later, synonymous with kingdoms, which shall arise out of the earth. They arise out of the earth. The kingdoms, although he saw the animals arise out of the sea. But it says here, the saints, in verse 18, the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and forever, and so on. Now verse 23, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be, not a fourth king, but a fourth kingdom upon the earth, a kingdom or government, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, as these beasts were diverse or different, that is, one from the other, and shall devour the whole earth and tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of the uh, kingdom, out of the fourth beast, are ten kings or other kingdoms that shall arise. Now in verse 27, and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven, it's not in heaven, it was on the earth, and the kingdom shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, will take over the government that these governments had been ruling on the earth. The saints will take them over and all dominions shall serve and obey him, which is referring to Christ at his second coming, and the saints will be ruling under him, as you will read in the second and third chapters of, of Revelation. If we overcome, we will sit with him on his throne. If we are overcomers, we will be given power over the nations and rule them with a rod of iron, as you read in other places in the book of Revelation. Now then, we know something about that these are kings and kingdoms and governments. But what kings, what governments are they? We still don't know. It doesn't reveal it here. We have to go back still further now back into the second chapter of Daniel. We go all the way back into the second chapter of Daniel now. And Daniel was called on to uh, reveal a dream to the then reigning King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, there had been many ancient city-states, just cities that were governments in themselves, finally became whole nations, of which was Egypt, ancient Egypt, and, and there was ancient Greece, and other nations of that sort. But the first world empire, growing into a group of nations as an empire, was formed by this Nebuchadnezzar, about 604 B.C. This Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the first world empire, had a dream. 
And Daniel, the prophet Daniel, one of the Jewish lads in the captivity who had been taken captive when uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his army had overcome the kingdom of Judah in Jerusalem and conquered them and brought them as slaves into Babylon. And Daniel was a very brilliant young Jewish lad who was giving an important part in the government. And they learned that somehow God revealed dreams and things to him. And so he was brought in to this King Nebuchadnezzar who had a great dream. He had called the uh, fortune tellers and all those people in the kingdom in to tell him the dream. And of course, they couldn't tell him what he dreamed. And he claimed he had forgotten and he was just testing them. But Daniel said there was a God in heaven that would reveal it to him. And so he prayed to God for the revelation of the dream that this king had had. Now I come to the second chapter and verse 28 in Daniel where Daniel said before this king Nebuchadnezzar, but there is a God in heaven who revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Getting down to our time now, the last days. I mentioned a booklet several times recently. Let me mention it once again. Are we living in the last days? That's a booklet I have. Are we living in the last days? Because here is a prophecy about our time now in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed were these. Now he went on to describe it. I will just say that he saw an image that was so great it was terrifying. And it had a great head of fine gold. It had uh, a breast and arms of silver, a belly and thigh of brass, and it had legs of iron, strong, and feet and toes, part of iron and part of miry clay, especially the ten toes on the feet. And the, the, the king had seen such a vision, but he didn't understand what it was. And Daniel came to tell him, Thou, O king, Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom. He was a king of kings. In other words, a number of nations. There were other nations under him. He said, The God of heaven hath given you a kingdom and power and strength and glory. Then he continues, Thou art this head of gold. Now we begin to understand the meaning of these symbols. And after thee shall arise another kingdom or another world empire inferior to thee, just as silver is inferior to gold, but silver is a little stronger than gold and militarily it was going to be stronger, but spiritually or morally it was inferior. And another third kingdom of brass, again still inferior morally or spiritually, but stronger materially and in military power, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Now we know that's not some magic man coming to bear rule over the earth. This is the ancient kingdom of the Greco-Macedonian Empire. And a fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. Now we know what that was. That was the Roman Empire. Now we come to verse 44. And in the days of these kings, which was speaking of the feet and the ten toes, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, the kingdom of God, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms. It will rule all of the nations of this earth together and it shall stand forever. Now that's getting down to our day. And it shows that Christ's coming is going to smite this whole image representing the governments of this world on the toes. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, in other words, not human hands, but coming supernaturally from God, which is the coming of Christ in power and glory as the King of kings to rule all nations, and that it break in pieces the iron and the brass, the clay, the silver, 
and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. And that, my friends, is the kingdom of God. And speaking of Christ coming to set up and to rule the kingdom of God. And so here we have it all the way through. So you can see that Daniel saw it in four wild animals. The first was like a lion. That was equivalent to the head of Nebuchadnezzar's image. And the second was the uh, bear with the strong feet. And that was equivalent to the uh, next kingdom that followed, the Persian Empire. And the third beast that Daniel saw in the seventh chapter was like a leopard, swift and cat-like, uh, very rapid and fast. And it had four heads. That was the Greco-Macedonian Empire. Now, Philip of Macedon died when he was just going to start a war. And his son, Alexander, who became known as Alexander the Great, took it up. And he had the swiftest army that the world had ever known, like a leopard. He came down and conquered the whole world. He died in a drunken debauch. He said he died in despair because there were no more worlds to conquer. He'd conquered all the world, and he knew in those days the whole world centered around the eastern Mediterranean, as far as they knew in those days. And in his stead came up four divisions, each headed by one of his four generals of his army. And that represented the four heads of Daniel's third beast like a leopard. And then the fourth beast that Daniel had, strong like iron, was the same as the Roman Empire, which followed that with the strength of iron and ruling the whole world at that time ruling on the west, ruling all of the east, on both sides of the Mediterranean Sea. Now the Roman Empire fell in 476 AD. It was restored as the Holy Roman Empire, it was called, in 554 AD. And that continued until 1814. Now the Bible says it is to be revived once again a revival of the so-called Holy Roman Empire of the Middle Ages. Now the 10 toes will be 10 nations forming in Europe and then it is going to end. The stone that will smite it on the feet is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And he's going to set up a kingdom, the kingdom of God that will rule over all the nations of the world and it will last forever. I wonder if you know that the gospel of Jesus Christ was suppressed within 21 or 22 years after he preached it. It had been suppressed and was not preached in the world until now. And Jesus Christ himself in the 24th chapter of Matthew was asked for a sign of his second coming as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end of this world come. And he said, this gospel of the kingdom, the government of God, it's the family of God, the born again family of God, not born again into human beings, but born again into divine beings. You see, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit, said Jesus Christ, is spirit. And we are not spirit. And nobody who is, for, is, is flesh and blood is born again or has been born again. But we have a lot of people, even a few million of them, claiming to be born again now, and they are simply deceived. That is not scriptural. It's not according to the Word of God. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And the gospel that Jesus proclaimed was the kingdom of God about a government. And we, Christians, and the church is merely the kingdom of God being trained and having the Holy Spirit of God and learning the way of life of God. 
of God's way of life, to be changed from mortal to immortal, from human to divine, and to rule over all nations under Christ when he comes in his second coming to rule. That, my friends, is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which has not been proclaimed for 1950 years and is being proclaimed this minute in your ears and you're listening to it. And it's time that we begin to heed it. Now, I want to go on a little further in this and in a little more detail in the book of Revelation. We'll put that off till later. But meantime, that mysterious book of Revelation, it is unveiled now so you can understand it. And here I have a book that I'd like to offer to you, the book of Revelation unveiled at last. I've read to you in previous programs how in Daniel, the 12th chapter, the prophecy that was given to Daniel, which runs right along with the book of Revelation, was closed and sealed until the time of the end, when many would run rapidly to and fro, like we do on automobiles and airplanes and every way of speed today, and knowledge would be increased. Oh, what a time of increase of knowledge. But here the book of Revelation is open to our understanding at last, and you can understand it, and it tells of the events that are going to open up the way. Now, I'm going to show you later that this beast of the 17th chapter of Revelation is a coming United States of Europe that is being formed right now, and that will bring on the great tribulation and that will end in the second coming of Christ, the end of this present civilization of this world and the beginning of the wonderful world tomorrow. You need this booklet on Revelation. You need that booklet that I mentioned. You need this booklet, the United States and Britain and prophecy. Where is the United States and Britain mentioned in Bible prophecy? And specifically, what's going to happen to us in this great tribulation that's pending right now in the next few years? The only way you can know what is going to happen to us, prophecy has been closed. It's unlocked in this book, The United States and Prophecy. And I'd like to send you your subscription to the Plain Truth magazine. I've mentioned that time and again. There is no cost. There's no subscription price to the Plain Truth. There's no charge for these booklets. We want to give. All right, friends, I'm going to come on out right there because uh, Mr. Armstrong is about to give the address for where to send in for the material he's offering, which no longer a valid address nor the phone number that is going to be mentioned at the end of that program. But, you know, uh, not only is this material available online with easy Internet searches on either Bing, Google, or any of the other Internet search engines out there, with dozens of hits coming up when you search for any of that literature thankfully god has opened up a door a new door the door of the internet a door that wasn't open when mr armstrong was alive but it almost it sure seems that one of the purposes god may have had in opening that door of the internet was because god intended to preserve mr armstrong's publications, his writings, and his speaking in the way of recordings of his radio broadcast, telecast, his Bible studies, his sermons, and they're all here on the internet, easily available for at an internet search. And we have a lot of them on our own page on cogtv.org on the library, under the library menu, the library page, including where Mr. Armstrong was mentioning at the end of this broadcast, the United States and Britain and Prophecy, a few months ago, I spent a couple of months, uh, week by week, sometimes Friday night Bible study, and then the next morning we'd, we'd do another chapter. We'd go chapter by chapter uh, with each live stream. And on some weekends, some Sabbath weekends, I'd do two chapters, one on the Friday night Bible study, uh, next chapter the next morning on the Sabbath service, <clears throat> and then approximately two months, we got through the entire book, uh, reading it aloud along with scrolling text. For those of you that like the advantages of video, where you can, and some of you that are hard of hearing, uh, have told me you appreciate the scrolling text. One of you have asked me for a DVD on that. Yeah, I do. That's another thing on my plate I need to get to. I sure would like to have 
lots of good help and maybe some more facilities out in the back that could be offices that people could come and work in, serve in, do volunteer service. <clears throat> you know, we I might even be able to sell my house and just buy a bunch of stuff, put it back there and have some funds to pay some of you to help me. But uh, <clears throat> that'd be nice because there are a lot of things we could yet do. This telecast you just saw, though, was, in my opinion, one of the most outstanding telecast um, you've done there Mr. Armstrong just outstanding and of course with people that help I used to work in television for studio there for a couple of years my first two years at college I'd come to when I came to college I had worked at three different television stations in Florida and Mr. Norman Smith liked that wanted to know what's going on in the local stations and and uh he told the acceptance committee, when Mr. When Stephen Gilbert gets here, don't send him anywhere else to work. He's coming up here and work for me. So, um, and, I, and I did. And I, I knew what went on in television. I was able to tell Mr. Smith, uh, I, I was able to ask him, I said, Mr. Smith, you know, uh, if we're going by the standard rate and data service, which is publication that lists all the television stations and how much it costs to... Uh, run a program, half hour, hour program on a station. The standard contract, which most of the station use, that standard rate and data service contract, provides for X number of 30-second promos during the week for your program coming up on a certain day, and so many 10-second promo spots. And I was aware of that because I just, when I worked at the television station, I was I was just observing everything I could, and I learned that, and I shared that with Mr. Smith as a question, you know, well, <clears throat> if we're using a standard rate and data service contract, which is what most stations use, why aren't we taking advantage of all these 30 second spots that come with the contract as part of the one price that we're already paying? And he said, oh, I wouldn't wear that. He says, we'll check into that, Stephen. And uh, he, got, he got back to me. He said uh, he had the uh, Stanley Raider and the, those that worked in the uh, worldwide media, whatever we called it then, the a agency, the service that uh, Mr. Armstrong had Stan Raider operating for the church that would buy the uh, buy the television time. They later connected it with some other agencies <clears throat> too that were very was a very effective combination of things. But uh, excuse me one second, brother. Let me clear my throat. But Mr. Smith got back to me and said, yeah, Stephen, they checked on all that, and you're right. <clears throat> we have a couple of hundred contracts out there <laughs> providing us uh, hundreds of free 30-second uh, promo spots that we're not taking advantage of. And he says, <clears throat> your job, even as a student working 20 hours a week here, your job, Stephen, uh, you'll stay under the man that we had you assigned under here, uh, but your job will be to head up <clears throat> uh, the promotion department, and <clears throat> you'll go around and coordinate putting together the 30-second spots and the 10-second promo things. So that became my job, even as a student, and the job grew to such an extent. I was able to coordinate, because I had all, everybody that worked full-time, I was able to draw on them, the writers who wrote the scripts for the 30-second copy and for the 10-second copy. Well... I just told them what we needed, and they'd do it. You know, I didn't have to do it. I just had to go coordinate it. The people who produced the graphic for the 10-second uh, slide that we'd put in little aluminum metal containers, and um, uh, I'd just go look at it, and they'd, the guy doing the artwork would say, Steve, do you like this? Does this look appropriate to this program? And I'd, I'd get to make the decision or make comments to him. Of course, he came up with ideas, and, and that was great and helpful. I, most of the time, I'd simply said, yeah. That graphic you just you just did there that's perfect <laughs> that's perfect for that this the coming weeks uh, program that we'd already had recorded you know we'd record them ahead which gave us time to get the promos together and get them mailed out a week ahead of when the program would air and let the station be playing those and I just coordinate and I've, I coordinated I helped with the uh, the shipping all that out that was a big job getting all that package but the videotape editors they would run off all those couple hundred tapes and then I'd take them and Jerry 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 who did the lighting who also was responsible for shipping the main program 
he and I together packaged those promo things up and shipped them out for the videotapes. And then me and some of the gals that worked for the guy I worked under, Art Michaud, uh, we'd package up the ones for the uh, for the 10 second promo slots uh, and, and and so we took advantage of that anyway that became my job there for a couple of years but um, this was one of the, the most outstanding programs covering Mr. Armstrong covering detail and like Billy Graham said Mr. Armstrong knows the details of the Bible you're going to hear when we start reading off a few of the references Mr. Armstrong would make to Billy Graham, you'll hear Mr. Armstrong say how Billy Graham told him in a telephone conversation that they had together. Uh, he praised Mr. Armstrong for having a ministry of prophecy. And like that was where Mr. where Billy Graham boxed Mr. Armstrong, having a ministry of prophecy. And like he was... Billy Graham believed, well, you'll hear Mr. Armstrong say this moment, B Billy Graham believed in various different types of ministries, and so he thought God gave Mr. Armstrong the ministry of prophecy. You'll hear that in a moment. Uh, <laughs> you'll hear Mr. Armstrong's other balancing comments that go along with that, too. In fact, let's go ahead and go over there and see. Uh, all right, Mr. Armstrong, you finish. I'm going to take your lower third off. And... Let me come in here. Uh, let's see. I'll come in here tighter as we switch that, so this will, so this will work. Let's see. All right. Hang on a second. I'm gonna keep that back in the background till I line it up. Oh yeah. All right. I do kind of have it. I got it queued up on the next, the next, the first of the comments where Mr. Armstrong references Billy Graham. So let me scroll it on up here, and we'll bring it in tight. Let's just go. I'll go ahead and go in there tight on it. Um, all right, again, this is, this is from a sermon on December 17, 1983, a sermon entitled Mission of the Philadelphia Church Era. And all these sermons are sermons given by Mr. Armstrong, Herbert W. Armstrong, God's end-time apostle, Herbert Armstrong. And Mr. Armstrong, uh, right here, I, I take out just a few paragraphs where he mentions Billy Graham every time. Right here, Mr. Armstrong said, Blah, 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 who in uh, kind of a subtitle, who and what God is. No religion on earth knows who and what God is. No religion on earth, Mr. Armstrong said. And then he makes the reference to Billy Graham saying, Billy Graham doesn't know it. And he mentions a few others too. Jerry Falwell doesn't know it. Roman Catholics don't know. And Mr. Armstrong goes on to say, God is not a trinity. God is not a single person. God is a family of persons, and the family began with God and the Word. You read of that in John 1, verses 1 to 5, Mr. Armstrong says. You read of it in Genesis 1, beginning with verse 1. You should learn about God first, and it begins first both in the New Testament and the Old, because many experts feel, that is so-called experts, let me add, so many Many experts feel that the book of John should be placed first in the New Testament, although it was not written first. God is a family, and it began with the two, God and the Word, and we can, we, and we can be born into that family. Okay, you know, now you notice, brethren, I'm giving you a little bit of the context in which Mr. Armstrong would make a reference to Billy Graham, so, uh, so that it fits, and you, you begin to see that when Mr. Armstrong would make statements like, Billy Graham doesn't understand, and some of the references to Billy Graham will be not so much a reference per se to him only, but it'll be a reference to all of the Protestant world, all of the Protestant daughters of the Roman Catholic Church, and the just the overall different belief from the truth. And so let's go on to another one here from a sermon given on the Day of Trumpets, September 11, 1980. Mr. Armstrong is saying, but the New Testament church received the Holy Spirit on that day of Pentecost. That's when the church began. Christ had prepared the church for three and a half years. He had taught and trained the apostles to be apostles and train them in the gospel of the kingdom 
in order to take that gospel of the kingdom to the world. Now, Mr. Armstrong asks, what is the church? When we get to that, you know one of the things that the people in the world and the churches of the world simply do not know. They don't know that Jesus was born to be a king. You don't hear that. You don't hear the great evangelist preach Jesus was born to be a king. They don't preach Jesus as a king. They just simply say Jesus is a savior. Give your heart to the Lord and you'll be saved. You'll see the way they picture it. This life they picture as being on a railroad trip. That's, now that's the whole life that you're living. And you go down this life. Now at the end of the trip on the track of the railroad, the track is set. There's a switch and one switch shoots the track or the train that you're on straight down to hell. But it's already set. Now if sometime along on the trip, which is your lifetime, you say, all right, I accept Christ. That changes the switch on the track at the end of the line. And then when you get there, now the switch is going to shoot you right up to heaven. Well, of course, that's a lot of fall to all. And it isn't true at all. But a lot of people believe that. They're simp they, they've simply been deceived. Satan is the great deceiver who deceives a few people here and a few people there. No, Mr. Armstrong says, like, Revelation 12, verse 9 says, who deceives the whole world. But what they don't know is that Jesus was born to be a king, that he came to announce a kingdom, a government. The gospel and the church are concerned with government. I'm just talking to our local group, and I'll say it. Does Billy Graham understand that? Do you ever hear him preach about the church and government and that Jesus is a king and that we're going to rule with Christ in a government? Oh, no. They don't believe that at all. They don't say anything about it. You just live your life the way you want, but you must accept Christ, and then you'll just go to heaven. I have heard Billy Graham say the Bible says when we all get to heaven. I'll give a check for $10,000 if he'll show me where the Bible says that. You know, I've never seen that in the Bible. Neither have you, and neither will you, because the Bible doesn't say any such thing. The Bible says that no man has ascended up to heaven, Acts 2, verse 34, and with Jesus Christ saying that too, and the Bible quotes him. I'm just talking to our local group, and I'll say, does Billy Graham understand that? Do you ever hear him preach about the church and government? Okay, we, uh, we, we actually covered that point. I have that up there twice. For some reason, I got it from some place that had that in all caps, or I typed it in all caps at some point. Uh, but I want to turn to Acts 2 real quick and make sure I give you the right verse. It's either 29 or 34. They both relate to the same thing, showing that we don't go to heaven when we die. In fact, we're going to stay here on earth when Christ returns, meet him in the air, and become, come down with him to, the, to, the, uh, to sit on his throne of this earth and rule with him here on this earth for a thousand, a thousand years. Acts 2, verse 29 says, Men and brethren, Peter speaking, let me speak freely unto you of the patriarch David. I read this to you earlier. Let's read it again. That he is both dead, duh, he's dead, and buried, and his sepulcher, his tomb, is with us unto this day. Then verse 34, where it mentions, verse 34 is the reference to David not being ascended to heaven. For David is not ascended into the heavens. Verse 34, Acts 2. There you go. You got it. Make a note of that so you have it. All right, let me roll this. Because uh, you may need that. There are people that may ask you about that. And they, they don't want to just hear your opinion. Tell them to turn in their own Bible like Mrs. Runcorn did with Loma D. Armstrong. When Mrs. Mrs. Armstrong was asking questions about the Sabbath, Mrs. Runcorn had a very 
effective way of dealing that by saying, Mrs. Armstrong, look in your Bible. Look at this verse in your Bible. In your Bible. Look it up yourself. Um, all right. Now, I have heard Billy Graham say, the Bible says when we all get to heaven. And then Mr. Armstrong said he'd give a check for $10,000 if he'll show me where in the Bible it says that, which it, it doesn't. <clears throat> okay. Now, let's go back full screen to the text here because we got a sermon from July 9, 1983, entitled, Are You Really a Christian? by Mr. Armstrong. All these quotes, again, are from Mr. Armstrong. Are you really a question? Are, uh, I'm sorry, a question. Are you really a Christian? Are you really a member of the church? You know, it's by one spirit we are all baptized into the one body, the church. And Brennan, I want to come out just for a moment because I started at the beginning. I read you the quote from July 4, 1981, where Mr. Armstrong said <clears throat> they've been going through line by line the Constitution and bylaws of the uh, of the corporation. Uh, well, they even had a Constitution and bylaws for the unincorporated Worldwide Church of God and and for the corporated Church of God. They did it. They formalized everything related to the name Worldwide Church of God, <clears throat> and they pointed out that it's a non-member organization that's titled Worldwide Church of God. So that one Sabbath that he played a little trick on everybody, I put it like that, he played a trick. He did cause, because uh, he wanted to know what people believed. And then after everybody who raised their hand raised their hand to the question, everybody who's a member of the Worldwide Church of God, raise your hand. Okay, come on, raise them high now. Get them up there. Let me see. If you're a member of the Worldwide Church of God, get your hands up there. <clears throat> you know, I'll just repeat the question Mr. Armstrong asked, but in the time order where we are right now, any of you who think you were members of the Worldwide Church of God at some point in your life when you were attending services under Mr. Armstrong here and there, raise your hand right now, even at home. If you were ever a member of the Worldwide Church of God, raise your hand. Come on, raise them high. I can't see you really. I, you know, I don't have any magic tube that lets me see you back this way. But let the people in the room see you. If you were a member of the Worldwide Church of God ever, at any time when you were attending services with us or whatever, if you were a member of the Worldwide Church of God, raise your hand. And raise it high. Come on, get them up there high. Like Mr. Armstrong said to you. All right, now, then Mr. Armstrong told everybody, and I'm going to say the same thing to you that he said. Put your hands down. You people that have your hands up saying you were, you are, or at one time were, a member of the Worldwide Church of God. Mr. Trump says, said, no, none of you, none of you are members of the Worldwide Church of God. And I'm saying in time order today, none of you who may have raised your hands out there saying you were at one time a member of the Worldwide Church of God, put your hands down. You were never. Never, never, never. How can I emphasize that so you get the point? You were never a member of the Worldwide Church of God. Now, that's according to God's end-time apostle who, through whom, the Worldwide Church of God organization was created. He says you were never, you were not a member of it, those who raised their hands saying they were, at the, that present tense time then. And so you never were, none of you, ever, were members of the Worldwide Church of God. Never, 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 unless, as he then said, unless you were at one time one of its board of directors. And there were only 12 of those at any one given time. And very few people were ever those. So those are, that's the only exception to those who were members of the Worldwide Church of God. Now then what he went on and emphasized was... Brethren, you were baptized, just like he was saying here in this sermon, you were baptized into the body of Jesus Christ, the church of God, simple church of God, a spiritual organism, he emphasized and underscored, not a physical organization, corporate or otherwise, any organization of men. You were not baptized into an organization of men or into any denomination. You were 
baptized, as he underscored, as he was saying this, put your hands down, you were baptized into the body of Jesus Christ, the church of God, a spiritual organism, a spiritual organism. And so we should have got the point. And anybody who heard what he said on J July 4, 1981, where he explained that then, if he asked this question later, if they'd heard what he said on July 4, 1981, he should not have been raising her hand. He said, are you a member of the Worldwide Church? Everybody who's a member of the Worldwide Church, you got to put your hands up. Now you should know. And the principle involved there, some of you out there who are saying, I'm a member of the ABC Church of God or the DEF or the JKY or the JKL or XYZ Church of God. I'm, you know, and I'm purposely using a bunch of letters that won't necessarily relate to the letters that are the acronyms for this or that particular Church of God group denomination out there, which Mr. Armstrong said, we are not members of a denomination. And in fact, if we understood the principle behind it, no denomination springing off forward from where we were after we became scattered, which is what we are today, we are scattered. No denomination should have ever been created or established. And ministers who are staying very faithful to the teachings, as Titus requires a minister to do, Titus 1, verses 7 through 9, requires that we hold fast to the teachings as we as we were taught and to teach as we were taught that's a requirement to the ministry Titus speaking to the ministry you ministers who've done that you need to undo it you you really if you want to be not have to answer to Jesus Christ for mistakes that are that can cause people to stumble you should undo it one minister was told me who I became his caregiver for, that while he was in the hospital with cancer, he told me on his own initiative, he said, Stephen, God told me while I was in the hospital with cancer, when I get out, you know, meaning if God lets you out of here, you got to be, and he committed to it when God told him to. And so God did let him out, and God cured him totally of the cancer with a doctor telling him when he let him, when the doctor let him out of the hospital, telling him he had three weeks to live. He lived another year, and after six weeks, we had a second doctor who took his blood, uh, who took his blood initially, too, and yes, he had cancer. The second doctor said, yeah, he's got it, and here's, here's something you can do to help, which we believe God was helping engineer, too, but God, it still required the healing. And, and after six weeks, the, that second doctor took his blood again and said, Guys, I have good news. Cancer's in total remission. It, zoop, it's totally gone, which is amazing. That much cancer as he had gone that quickly tells you something very miraculous happened. And he gained 25 pounds in those same six weeks or a little more. He came out when we weighed him a couple of days out of the, after he was out of the hospital, after I'd been feeding him really a lot good, healthy food for a couple of days. He weighed 113. Six weeks later, after continuing the good, healthy food, he weighed 138, had gained 25 pounds. <clears throat> and he came out probably at around 110, 111 pounds when he actually, the day he got out of the hospital. We went to a, a big meal immediately when we got out of the hospital. He wanted to stop at one of my favorite restaurants, an Indian buffet restaurant in on the south side of Birmingham. And... Uh, he was. He went out of the hospital, and the hospital closed. They made him wait all day, and from the time they let him, told him, okay, finally he can leave, uh, and, you know, he had to stay in his hospital again until they told him he could leave. I said, well, you want to change your clothes? No, let's get out of here, Stephen. While they're saying I can go, we were supposed to be able to go this morning. It was, you know, well into the evening before we were able actually to go. He said, no, uh, just wheel me out of here. <laughs> so, so, uh, so we left immediately while he's still in a hospital gown. We drive over to the restaurant, and in the parking lot at the at the restaurant, of, at the, in the parking lot of the restaurant, inside the car, you know, nobody could see <coughs> him doing this, uh, he changes into his clothes, the clothes I'd brought. I brought a suit and a white shirt and a tie, everything. He put all that on 
from inside the car, took that hospital gown off and put on that suit <laughs> right inside the car there at the restaurant. We ate that night, and we, and I, anyway, uh, what's the point of all that? All right. God had told Mr. Armstrong, uh, told uh, uh, Robert Collins that when you get out of here, I want you to undenominate this group you've started and put a name on it. And he did that. Now, guess what happened? The people in that group, every single one of them, rejected Mr. Collins because of that. And they told him he couldn't meet with them anymore, and they were going to continue services. They had no ordained minister, and so they're violating everything we're taught. we were taught by Mr. Herbert Armstrong uh, that Herman Hay backed up in an article that Mr. Armstrong approved and was published. I have it on our website, too, that says, you know, you shouldn't assemble without an ordained minister present. You can, with nobody leading the group, you can play Mr. Armstrong's sermons, and that's like having a minister with you. Uh, but nobody else should be leading the group or leading a Bible study or doing the preaching. And this man started telling Mr. Collins even before he got out of the hospital <clears throat> that instead of playing Mr. Collins' tapes or Mr. Armstrong's tapes while Mr. Collins was in the hospital, <clears throat> The man was taking transcripts of Mr. Collins' sermons and reading them to the people. And Mr. Collins' wife said, Honey, he recognized what the guy was doing. She, she said, He's taking the first steps and taking over your group. And sure enough, after they kicked Mr. Collins out, after he took the name off the group, they and they continued to try to use the name. They said, We're going to keep, we want, we like this name. We're going to keep, we're going to keep this group in this name. Mr. Collins had to write them an attorney styled, cease and desist letter saying, look, God told me to denominate this, and I started that. That name represents me, Mr. Collins, because I started it. I, you know, I created that, and I, and that, and essentially I have the rights over it, and, I, and I'm doing what God said, do to take the name off this group, and you, you guys cease and desist using it. Well, they went on for two or three weeks, and then one of them comes over with, uh, all the songbooks and all the tapes and anything else that had that name on it turned them over to Mr. Collins and said, okay, we, we, we're going to relinquish use of that name. <clears throat> but then they can still continue to meet. I don't think they came up with a new name. Maybe they did, but they can still continue to meet with one of their ordained men conducting services and then bragging, ah, we got this new member from someplace else, you know, and, <clears throat> which really didn't pan out. And some of the members, some of the people that were attending there eventually stopped and one of them came over well, it was maybe months later maybe six months later came over saw mr collins and apologized for being among those who rejected him when he told them that god had told him told him to take the name off the group and gave the reasons and printed a bulletin even and gave it out that he explained the two main reasons that he understood why god told him to denominate that group and you know, in principle, that's what the rest of you ministers out there should do, what God had Mr. Arm, had Mr. Collins do, denominate his group, and expect what probably uh, happened to Mr. Collins to happen to you. The, the, your, all your people will reject you, but maybe not. If you do it orderly and with good instruction, you know, and if and don't let rebels, don't do it in the home of a real rebel who wants to set himself up, up as the new leader, <clears throat> then maybe maybe you'll be effective at it. Because where we are right now, brethren, we are scattered. And God has left us scattered. He has not appointed a new apostle, some claiming out there to be the new apostle, or acting as if they were without the name, because they because of the fact that they've set up a nominated group that you're not really a member of. You're not a member of the ABC Church of God or the XYZ Church of God, even if you're attending there every week. <clears throat> you know, or you shouldn't be, according to God's apostle, where he told us we were not baptized in any organization of men or denomination. We were baptized into the body of Jesus Christ, which today is a scattered body. God has not established a group or an organization for it, or any one man to be leading the body at this time. We are scattered. Now, if you want to support a local minister so you can have local anointings and local fellowshipping and meetings together, that minister, if he would do it without nominating a group and just say, look, we're the church of God in 
in Mozambique or with the Church of God in Hooliville or, you know, the local city. Where, you know, because the Church of God, what is the Church of God? Mr. Armstrong explains it. And the Bible, he explains it from the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, several places tell you the Church of God is the body of Christ. The body of Christ is composed of members whom God has called and laid, had hands laid on by ordained ministers and through that process given his Holy Spirit. It's, and so it's members who are led by God's Spirit, who have and are led by God's Spirit. That is the church of God, the members whom God has called. It's a spiritual temple, a spiritual organism. As Mr. Armstrong well put it, a spiritual organism. And, it's, and that is the members, not physical stuff, not buildings, not names of organization, not organizations of men of any kind, not denominations, but members, and the members God has us scattered. He has not one leader over us. You, we still have an ordained ministry, and that ministry should, to the degree it stays faithful to the teachings and the truth God gave us through his end-time apostle Herbert Armstrong, his most faithful servant, Herbert Armstrong, to the degree a local minister with whatever title to him, whether it be evangelist or whatever, as long as he stays faithful to the true teachings, well, fine. Ha you know, if you want to assemble with him locally and have fellowship and he not be calling that fellowship by any name that makes it appear like we're one big new church that stemmed is the, the place where the baton moved from Mr. Armstrong. That hasn't happened. And that we shouldn't be given that false appearance because where there are potential new brethren, some have chewed me out, and it's not my fault <laughs> that all these organizations have put names on themselves and denominated themselves so that we have 600 or more or 1,000 or more of them now that confuse potential new brethren who say, that's confusion, that's not Christ, I don't want any part of that. And that's what some of you are part and parcel in helping to establish out there, confusion that confuses potential new brethren not that I know that God's going to call that many new ones, but if we need 144,000, he may have to at some point before the eagle flies. All right, let's go back to this. Okay, now I did a little diversion, and let me get the lower third out of the way, and we'll go back to where we left off. All right, now, and Mr. Arshan mentions what I just mentioned about scattered and the possibility of scattering. He asked this question. Now let's go back that up and tell us where we were again. I didn't mean to back up that far. Let me see if I can get us back down to where that was. Okay, all right, we did that section. Bear with me, I just goofed up here when I hit the button, took it all the way back to the top. We can scroll it back down real quickly, kind of. Uh, that was a perfect section to follow what I was just saying. It was right after this. Here we go. From a sermon on July 9, 1983, Are You Really a Christian? This is the sermon that these following comments come from. Mr. Armstrong says, Are you really a Christian? Are you really a member of the church? Not any denomination, not any organization of men, but of the church. He says, You know, it's by one spirit we are all baptized into the one body, the church. And... It's not many bodies, Mr. Armstrong is saying from this sermon, Mr. Armstrong's words right here from July 9, 1983, and it's not many bodies, not many, a whole bunch of different named groups, a bunch of different denominations stemming off the Worldwide Church of God, but it's, it's not many bodies scattered and all believing something different, and they all, those different bodies do, do teach some differences, sadly. Mr. Armstrong says there is only one church. That is one church of God. And you'll notice he, there's no, not even worldwide mentioned here. At the time Mr. Armstrong was speaking, when we had the physical corporation, the worldwide church of God, he says that, that there's only one church. That is one church of God. He goes on to say there are many churches but they are churches of men. <clears throat> so 
some of you out there who've established blankety blank this or that church of god group should really take note of this there are many churches but they are churches of men they are actually churches of satan the devil and there is a very great difference and what is the difference between a christian and someone who is not well, generally, a church member is supposed to be anyone who just joins the church. And there are so many churches. Satan has a great many. But God says we are put into the church not by joining, not baptized into it by water either, although water baptism is commanded, but by one spirit. We are baptized into the one body. Now, you know, many don't understand that baptism. They call it of the Holy Spirit, and there's no such expression in the Bible. In the Bible, it speaks about being baptized by the Holy Spirit. You are baptized by the Spirit into the church. Now, the word baptized means immerse. It means put into, and by one spirit, you are put into or immersed into the church. Not by joining, not by water baptism, not by accepting an argument, not by going forward at Billy Graham's service. Here's another reference to Billy Graham now, and that's why I've got these paragraphs and sentences here from various sermons. Not by going forward at a Billy Graham service, just going up and he'll say a few words of prayer for you and give you a little piece of literature, as he says, and you can take it home with you. I wonder if you really understand what is the difference and what the Holy Spirit means into one's life. Are you still just the same, or is there, a, is there a difference? What is that difference? In what way are you different? I want you to notice in Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 7, Mr. Armstrong going on here, Romans 8, verse 7, because the carnal mind, and that's the natural mind you were born with, and that is, well, specifically, if you would run this down, it is not speaking with exactly the mind you were born with or the mind that Adam was created with. It's the mind that Satan has made a natural mind to you. Now, we speak of nature. Nature is that which comes naturally. We in the church become partakers of God's nature. We receive God's nature. We weren't born with it. That's something we receive and we take on until it becomes natural, until it becomes natural to have a nature like God. Now, God has a nature that's one thing. It's the way that just becomes naturally to him. The carnal mind, in some translations, translated as the mind that is on materialism and material things. It's the mind that Satan has gotten into and changed, at least in its attitude. But the carnal mind is enmity against God. Romans 8, verse 7. Now, that word enmity, we don't use very much anymore. Remember, the King James translation was translated back in 1611 A.D., and that's about 350 years ago. In today's language, we would say hostile. All right, we're going to go to another sermon now. And, brethren, let me point out to you that uh, I've got some video by Mr. Uh, uh, some audio by Mr. Armstrong we're going to hear in his own voice him telling about the telephone conversation that he and Billy Graham had together that was a, a telephone conversation arranged by a salesman at Harrods of London England where both Billy Graham was a customer and Mr. Armstrong for the Ambassador College Brick at Wood was a customer and that salesman, when Mr. Armstrong was there per making some purchases, uh, said, I am Mr. Armstrong. Uh, I should set up a call with Billy Graham with you. And you know, because you know, I got his number, and, you know, and, and he did. He set up a phone call between the two of them. And uh, Mr. Armstrong will tell you about that in his own words after, we, after I just go through a few more of these, and then I'll switch over to that and play that for you. Uh, but here's, here's Mr. Armstrong mentioning Billy Graham in a sermon from October 1976, which was titled 50th Anniversary from the Time God First Called Mr. Armstrong, not from, the, not from the time the Philadelphia era started, but from the time God called Mr. Armstrong that 50th anniversary. In that sermon, 
during Feast of Tabernacles, Mr. Armstrong was saying, now, God decided to create matter. And when he did, he created the whole universe. Now, there's Saturn, and there's Jupiter, and there's Uranus, and there are other planets in our solar system. This Earth and our moon, and even our moon is a burned out old hulk, uninhabitable. It was not created that way. Something happened. And you don't hear Billy Graham preaching this. No, not at all. He'd say this was ridiculous. But I'm giving you what is the framework of the whole Bible. What is the main story flow? What is the real scenario of the picture? And when Mr. Armstrong says you don't hear Billy Graham preaching this, Billy Graham was the uh, epitome, or he was at the top, the echelon of the Protestant world from the United States preachers. Mr. Billy Graham was recognized as the preacher of preachers. I mean, he was, you know, the campaigns he conducted, many local preachers cooperated with him because Billy Graham promoted people after these campaigns to go find you one of these local churches and go to it. So the local pastors, yeah, hey, they love those kind of revivals because it brought people, it got people reactivated in church attendance, at least for a while in some cases. And so local pastors supported Billy Graham doing these big campaigns in the big stadiums and in their towns because it increased attendance for some time. And with attendance, the preachers would preach, you know, you pass the offering plate, put offering in there. Whether they taught tithing or not, many Baptist churches do understand correctly and preach tithing. And so well, they loved Billy Graham for that. But So Billy Graham was at the top. When Mr. Armstrong would mention Billy Graham doesn't preach that, he's really saying the whole Protestant world and the Catholic Church too, because the Protestant, the Protestant world are, it simply are the daughters of Catholicism, and the Catholics love to punch that point about any Sunday observance is because of us, the Catholic Church, not because you're going to find it in the Bible. In fact, they say you will not find it in the Bible. They say from Genesis to Revelation, you'll find the Bible telling you Saturday is the Sabbath, the day that God commanded people to teach. But we, the Catholic Church, we change that. And we say, observe Sunday, and we'll kill you when we're in consort with a holy Roman Empire that's going to be revived. We'll announce you anathema, and then the Roman Empire, when we announce you anathema, will put you to death over Judaizing, as the Council of Laodicea put it, over keeping the Sabbath, when we say that Sunday is the worship day, the day of Baal, the sun worship day. That's what the government coming and the revived Holy Roman Empire is going to be supporting and the movement toward that's are already underway. But let's go on back, finish these, let you hear Mr. Armstrong uh, in those recordings tell about his telephone conversation with with uh, Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Uh, you won't hear Billy Graham preaching this. No, not at all. He'd say that was ridiculous about how the world was created the framework of the whole Bible, what is the main story flow, what is the real scenario of the picture, and people today don't get the picture. They come in with, it's about seven-eighths over or nine-tenths over. They come in when, when it's about seven-eighths over or nine-tenths over, near the end, and they don't understand what's going on because they don't know what went on before. All right, now we'll move on to a sermon from on Romans 9 and 10, maybe this actually was a Bible study, January 5, 1980, by Mr. Armstrong, Herbert W. Armstrong, where he said, I have, a, I have whole volumes over there of Bible commentaries and Bible encyclopedias and a Bible dictionary, but they don't help me very much. The men who wrote these were very learned and scholarly men, but they did not have God's Holy Spirit, and they did not comprehend what's in this book. He's pointing to the Bible. They just didn't. God has given me more understanding than all of them put together, although they had a lot of technical knowledge that I don't have. But that's technical knowledge. But that technical knowledge, and it should say here, is, is I'm going to go ahead and just change that while we're, while we're live and while it's up on the screen. I can punch this button over here and just change that if to an is. That... Uh, but that technical knowledge is virtually useless, Mr. Armstrong said. They don't know why we're here. 
not one of them can tell you what and why what and why is man not one of them can tell you really what is god and it's all revealed in this book the holy bible they can't tell you who and what is god and no religion on the earth can tell you but billy graham can't tell you so here's another reference to billy graham meaning you know the whole protestant world the man recognized as the epitome of the protestant world billy graham the Protestant world can't tell you. They just don't know. They don't know what was the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then in that same sermon, Mr. Armstrong quotes from Romans 10, verses 5 through 9, for Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them, verse 6, but the righteous which is of faith, but the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this on this wise say not in your heart who shall ascend into heaven that is to bring christ down from above verse 7 or who shall descend into the deep that is to to bring up christ again from the dead but verse 8 what saith it what does it say the word is nigh you even in your mouth and in your heart that is the word of faith which we preach. That, verse 9, If you shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now you have to do that, Mr. Armstrong says, but that doesn't mean that there isn't something, that there is not something more you have to do beside. As I said a while ago, Adam and Eve, they couldn't have just reached out and taken of the tree of life. They had to actually reject the other tree of the knowledge of good and evil and reject Satan's way and accept Christ's way. And that's what Adam and, Adam and Eve did not do. Romans 10, verse 10, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and the heart really means attitude of mind, attitude of mind, I think the way it's expressed in the Bible, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 11, for the scripture saith, of course now, Billy Graham, people like that, will quote that kind of scripture right along, but they leave out the other parts of the scripture. Verse 11, Romans 10, for the scripture says, whosoever believeth on him, on Christ, shall not be ashamed, but to believe, you have to believe what he says, not just believe on him. All right, brethren, now we're going to go to another sermon, the sermon from February 14, 1981, entitled Building the Temple. And in that sermon, we've got some quotes where Mr. Armstrong again references Billy Graham, and here's what he says before that. Jesus came and preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. Jesus did not say, please accept me as your savior. He didn't come on a soul-saving crusade. Maybe Billy Graham thinks he did, but he didn't. He came announcing the coming kingdom of God, and he came saying, repent. Repent. John the Baptist prepared the way before him. And John the Baptist said, Repent and obey the law of God. To establish the law which is the basis of the which is the basis of the government of God. All goes back to the government of God again. Now people don't want anything to do with the government of God. They say, Oh, the law's done away. All the Protestant churches and the, and the Catholic Church all teach that. Your Bible does not teach that. God does not say that. But people don't believe God. They believe man. Man organized into the Catholic Church. Man organized into the Methodist Church and the Baptist Church. Or man organized into the Baptist churches and so on. All right, brother, now we turn to another sermon, this one going back to June 1982, a sermon entitled The Church is a New Civilization, where Mr. Armstrong says, So I tell you, what is the solution of all the troubles in the world? The world is in trouble. 
people say, well, Christ is the solution. What do you mean? Just, just believe him that there is a person like Christ? A great evangelist, well, Billy Graham has said that. Christ is the solution. In other words, you just believe that Christ is and say, I accept it. Oh, no, that's not the solution. The solution is that the Spirit of God must come as a result through Christ's presence, the door. But Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Spirit of the Father or except the Father that has sent me, draws him. And God is only drawing a few now. The spring harvest is a smaller harvest. Mr. Armstrong goes on and says, I want to get to that now. Why is God only drawing a few now? Why is God calling this church? But he's not calling the people in the Methodist or the Baptist or other churches. Does that sound like I'm a competitor and I'm talking with prejudice? Not at all, Mr. Armstrong says. He goes on and says, we are not in any competition with anybody. I'm only stating the fact. That's just as many of you sitting here as have the Spirit of God that are being led by the Spirit of God that are really in the church because you are not baptized into the church in water. You say, well, I most certainly was. Yes, I was baptized. What do you mean? Well, so and so baptized me in water. Well, that didn't mean that didn't put you into the church. Do you think it did? A lot of you've been thinking wrong. That didn't put you into the church. Let me read it to you. Romans the 8th chapter, the ninth verse. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. That's the spirit of God. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He's not a Christian, and he's not a member of the church. By one Spirit are we all baptized into the one body, the church. By one Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, not by water. By one Spirit, not by water. Water, baptize, water baptism is only something you are commanded to do to show that you are willing to do what God said, but that doesn't put you into the church. So don't ever say, oh, I'm a member of the church because I was baptized, meaning you were baptized in water. Not unless you have, not unless you have the Holy Spirit to open your mind to comprehend the teaching of God, and unless you are being led by that teaching, once you hear it, that you follow it. Not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Romans 2, verse th 13. And you'll notice a couple of places there, hearers of and doers of, somehow we missed the space in those. I'm going to pop that in real quick just so those of you reading this, maybe not hearing too well, can easily see what that should be reading. Mr. Armstrong goes on to say, you first have to hear it or read it, then you have to do it. Just knowledge alone won't save you. And just a point right here, brethren, that's one of the big problems of the people who are left behind in the coming ahead of us. Laodicean era. It's not here yet. Mr. Armstrong said it doesn't come until after the tribulation begins. And that's what Scripture says. There's only nine verses referencing the Laodicean era. The central verse, Revelation 3, verse 18, has four verses before it, four verses ever after it. The four, four verses before it can explain the condition of, of a Laodicean attitude, which attitude has existed since way back, since while Mr. Armstrong was alive. But the attitude is not the era, you know. And you have time to change the attitude if you have that kind of attitude before the era comes and you're left behind in it. When the era comes, you're, those who are left behind are stuck. You, you'll need to change your attitude and become a doer and even to the point of giving your life because the central verse, 18, God says, Christ speaking, I counsel you to buy of God gold tried in the fire 
God's end time apostle explaining correctly with all the understanding and context of Scripture, that is the fiery trial of martyrdom. That's what that era is about. The beast saying, you've got to bow down and worship the image of the beast, and you've got to work on the Sabbath, on God's Sabbath. You've got to work on it. And you say no to either one, you refuse. The Catholic Church has now announces you anathema, the Roman government, the Holy Roman Empire, the beast puts you to death. You become a martyr. You, they provided the way for you to buy of God gold tried in the fiery trial of martyrdom. So God provides what you need if you're left behind. You need to, you need to be hot. You need to be doing, uh, even though that doing is going to cause you to be put to death. But if you do what all you should do now, including Luke 21, 36, you can escape that time of great tribulation under the beast that will make you work on the Sabbath. You can be in a place described in Daniel 11, verse 41. We have often called it a place of safety. God refers to it in the Bible as a place of nourishment, protection. And, Mr. I, you know, we understand during that it's a period of 1,260 days, three and a half years. We'll have Sabbath services every week. We'll even have ambassador college classes every day. So it's going to be a time of final training, good training. You know, just do what you need to do to get there. And if you don't have everything now, you'll get it. And those who are just study, study, studying, and oh, I'll do it later, you know, but I need to study now. Well, you're missing the mark. If you study where it says do and you're not doing, you're going to be left behind. If you read Luke 21, 36, it says, watch and pray always. And you say, yeah, oh, I know we should do that, but i got to study some more. And you don't do the watching and the praying, you're going to be left behind. And then you're going to have to do what Christ said do in Revelation 3, 18. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fiery trial of martyrdom. Some of you don't like that. I know. You call me up, chew me out, and say, no, we're in the land of sin here and now, and blah, 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 blah. And we don't need to do, watch, do that watching. And Man, you... You people really know how some of some of you really know how to reject what God taught us through Mr. Armstrong, and you you reject his apostle, you reject the truth we were taught. You are going to wind up having to do what Christ said do in Revelation three eighteen. When everybody else, you know, who did do what God said do, the doers, when they're taken on two wings of a Revelation twelve fourteen eagle and flown into a Daniel 11:41 place of protection, safety. All right, with that diversion, let me go back, because I'm preaching to the choir. I realize probably most of you tuned in here are doing what you need to be doing, or at least know you should, and you know, hopefully you'll be encouraged to do it. You first have to hear it or read it, then you have to do it, Mr. Armstrong says in this sermon. Just knowledge alone won't save you. You have to have the knowledge before you know what to do, but it's the doing that finally saves you then. Mr. Einstein said, oh, I hope you can get these things straight. And brethren, I do too, because what Mr. Einstein was saying, the reason why he was so concerned and intent, brethren, half of you aren't getting it. Ninety percent of you aren't getting it. It's because if you don't get it and if you don't do it, you are going to be left behind in the worst time of trouble since the beginning of the world to the time coming and what's coming ahead of us in what is called the Great Tribulation. Let me back this up just a moment and put this slide up on here that shows the fifth seal, the Great Tribulation. We are to be watching those first four seals that are active. Luke 21, 36, Christ said, Watch and pray always. Now, he added therefore in there. Therefore, watch and pray always. Because in the previous verse 35, he said, this fifth seal, the great tribulation, the worst time of trouble since the beginning of the world to the time coming just ahead of us in this fifth seal, no nor ever after, nothing after it's going to be as bad, nothing before it's ever been as bad. You look at history and look at bad times, this should scare the blue in daylights out of you, that you might be left behind in a time of great tribulation as the King James renders what Christ said was mega trouble, worst time of trouble since the beginning of the world. You can escape it if you're watching the first four that are active now. Christ said, and he said, therefore, watch and pray always, because verse 35, I was about to explain how Christ says that it comes as a snare upon all them that dwell upon the face of the whole earth. In other words, tout le monde, Brother Reuben, 
everybody in the whole world. It comes up as a snare, as a shock, a surprise, like a thief in the night, totally unexpected as to when it comes. You, you may even know it's coming, but it's going to catch a lot of us off guard unless we're watching. And if we're watching, God's going to provide a Revelation 12, 14, two wings of an eagle, whether that be a literal eagle like we've been seeing flying in uh, oh, Facebook. Where was that area? Uh, huge eagles flying there that can swoop down and pick up animals. You know, and he calls it a great eagle. He called the fish that swallowed up Jonah a great fish. It could be literal or since Revelation is mostly symbolic, it could mean a modern jet aircraft, which didn't exist at the time of the Apostle Paul's writing in approximately 90 A.D. on the, the Isle of Patmos. There were no such things as aircraft, so he couldn't say a big airplane. You're going to fly you on a big airplane. So he had to use symbolism if that's what we're going to do. But God, it, it's a God's option. God can do it literally or he can do it symbolically. He's not stuck on that. He can do it either way. And to see a bunch of eagles flying around, that should almost even like, keep our mind focused on we ought to be doing this because when this thing springs like a thief in the night on everybody, those who are counted worthy at that moment, those who are doing what Christ said do, watching and praying, they get to escape. And he says, because it comes like a surprise, he says, therefore, do it. Watch and pray always so that you don't get left behind. That's what he's saying. That's the therefore. That's why the therefore is there. And he goes on holding out the carrot, the promise, saying, watch and pray always. Do these two things so that you can be accounted worthy to escape what's going to happen next. What's going to happen next after these first four blossom and bloom? The fifth, sixth, and seventh seal, the great tribulation, the sign and the, the heavenly sign, the astral signs and the sun, the moon, the stars that are telling us we're two and a half years in the great tribulation, and now we're about to move into the seventh seal, the year-long day of the Lord. Let me come over here tight for just a moment on this screen. We're about to enter the year-long day of the Lord, the pouring out of God's wrath mixed in with the pouring out of the wrath of men and Satan in the fifth seal great tribulation. There will be the sealing of 144,000 in between the sixth and seventh seal, then a silence in the heavens for a half hour, not proving that there's no women in heaven, because in heaven there's no sex. They're neither male nor female. They're like the angels, and they, the angels are neither male nor female. No angel could ever produce offspring with a woman because the angels don't have any genitals. They don't have. They're neither male nor female, God says, very clearly, very plainly. But God's wrath being poured out in seven trumpets, the first four and four winds destroying the earth, the last three being poured out, poured out in three woes of terrible punishments, woe one, woe two, and that great and terrible, dreadful woe three, the pouring out of the seven last plagues, and which happens after Christ returns. He returns on the sound of the trumpet at the beginning of the seventh seal. At the beginning of the seventh seal, the third woe begins and the pouring out of the seven last plagues at that time. Those who are part of the spring harvest who are accounted worthy to stand before the Son of Man, which is also part of Luke 21, 36, the latter part, the promise is if you watch and pray always, you'll be accounted worthy both to escape the fifth seal great tribulation and the sixth and seventh seal to the seventh seal, day of the Lord's wrath, and 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 you'll be able to uh, accounted worthy to stand before the Son of Man. Now, if, you know the whole package. But if you're not accounted worthy to escape, you're not accounted worthy to stand before the Son of Man either, unless you do the Revelation in your and you're left behind, and you then do the Revelation 3:18 counsel that God gives you to to buy of God gold tried in the fiery trial of martyrdom. All right, I wanted to give that warning. It fits in with what Mr. Armstrong was saying over here. And uh, let me come back to a screen that's got that type in the right size. Yeah. And then uh, let's go back to this and finish, finish these up so we can play Mr. Armstrong's comment where he tells about the phone call with, with Billy Graham before we run out of time. You first have to hear it or read it, then you have to do it. It's the doing that finally saves you then. And Mr. Armstrong says, oh, I hope you can get these things straight. It not only means your salvation, brethren, and standing before the Son of Man, it means being able to escape three and a half years 
of the worst time of trouble ever to hit the face of the earth. Let's go on now. Now then, I'm coming to the most important part of all. Mr. Armstrong from that sermon saying, Jesus said, I will build my church. But he also said, John 6, read it in your own Bible there, Mr. Armstrong saying. I've read it so many times. No man can come to me. Now, there's only one door to God, and that's Christ. There's no other way you can get to God but through Christ. And yet he said, no man can come to me, to Christ, except the Father, except the Father draws him. And God is only drawing a few. Why, Mr. Armstrong asked, why isn't he drawing them all? Mr. Armstrong goes on in that same sermon saying, you have to teach, you have to teach teachers to teach the others. Christ came to start a new world, a new civilization. People think that civilization is wonderful. Oh, it's Satan's civilization. Jesus came to start God's civilization. He started it with 12, then he started it with the church. Now, here are more than a thousand with us right here today, wherever he was preaching, had more than a thousand present, and each of us is going to be able to teach several hundred, if not a thousand. A thousand of us need to learn to teach a thousand, a thousand thousand, or a million. I guess so. How many does it take to teach the billions of the earth? That's why God did not call everybody. He was not calling the world to salvation. The world can't be saved until they learn the way of God, and to learn they first have to have the Spirit of God. Then they can begin to learn in the beginning of, of first and second grade. Then maybe the equivalent to junior high and high school, and then they can get into the college and university. He's calling us now in order that in the millennium we can teach the millions and even the billions. Listen, the world thinks that Jesus came preaching that you are, you just say you've you got the password, and I accept Christ. And you go forward and get a little Billy Graham present. All right, there's the reference in this section of Billy Graham. Then you go home and forget all about it tomorrow morning, and you're going to get into the kingdom of God. Oh, no, we have to learn the way of living of God, the way that is cooperation, that helps, that produces. And brethren, ultimately... After that thousand years and the great white throne judgment, we are going to go to other planets, and we're going to raise up new people. We're going to start new worlds, and it's going to go on and on until there are billions times billions of people. And God has started with a few of us. Wow, man, brethren, what is ahead of us? Does that mean anything to you? Is that a challenge to you to get on fire and to learn more? But learning alone isn't enough. That's what the problem of the Laodiceans have. Brethren, I'm interjecting that, so let me put my muggly mug here with you for a moment. That's what the problem of the Laodiceans have. They learn, 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 learn. They mow more than most of you out there and I may know. But they're not doing what they're learning. And that's going to be their, their, their problem, except that if they're willing to do it during the Great Tribulation and give their life, then they just bought their way into the marriage supper in the kingdom of God, and they'll be at the marriage supper with the rest of us, marrying Christ as part of the first resurrection, being his bride, serving with him a thousand years. But learning alone isn't enough. We pick up here where he says we have to be doers of the word as well as hearers and learners. So, so the hearing and the learning is important too, but we have to be doers so God is developing character, and that is the knowledge plus the action of doing. Now, uh, from Sermon Creation of the Gospel, I'm going to just let this roll, brethren. We're running out of time, and I want to get to... There, there are those things that Billy Graham and the modern Protestants say. The Catholics will say that they give you uh, something at the time you die, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to roll on through these. It's on the screen for you, because I want to get to the part where Mr. Armstrong talks about his telephone conversation with Billy Graham, and I want you to be able to hear that with your own words. Here's another reference to Billy Graham during a sermon on December 17, 1983, where the sermon title is Mission of the Philadelphia Church Era. Uh, Billy Graham doesn't know it. Jerry Falwell doesn't know it. Uh, God is, they don't, he, they don't know who and what God is. He's saying no religion on earth, on earth know it, and those leaders, those big-time church leaders don't know it. 
I'm going to roll on through this and get on to where Mr. Armstrong makes mention of his telephone conversation with Billy Graham. <clears throat> and this uh, part of the of the rolling text, uh, January 26, 1980, he mentions Billy Graham in, in, uh, here in this one uh, as he's uh, mentioning James and chapter 5. Um, I'm just letting this scroll on through so we can have time before our two hours are up to. Billy Graham will tell you that all you need to do is come and just receive Christ. He's he's on the getting side. You get, you receive, you take Christ, and hocus pocus, you're automatically saved. Well, you're not anything of the kind. Christ alone can't save you. The blood of Christ alone does not save anybody. The blood of Christ only wipes out your past guilt because it paid the penalty in your stead. But first, you've got to get reconciled to God because your sin was against God. Now, Jesus paid the penalty in your stead, but when you come to Christ and you come to God by way of Christ, you have to come to Christ first, but you, you've got to get straight with the Father by repentance. Repentance is toward God the Father, repenting of your past law-breaking. You've got to begin to keep the law and, know, and be obedient from now on and live a different life. And so we're only reconciled to God by the death of Christ, not saved by the death of Christ, but we're saved by his life, by his resurrection, as you will find it in, let's see, I forget the verses now, but anyway, it's in, it's in chapter 5 and chapter 6. Um, all right, I'm just going to skip through, brethren. It's on the screen. If you, you can stop it, if you playing this from the archive. From Sermon Spiritual Health Checkup, April 1983, Mr. Armstrong mentions, references Billy Graham again in that sermon. Um, I'm just letting it scroll on the screen so we can get to where Mr. Armstrong mentions the telephone conversation he had with Mr. Armstrong. And, and we'll play the audio that goes along with that. The one who wrote the Koran didn't know that. He doesn't reveal that. He didn't know it. The whole Arab world is in darkness. Um, and no different, the Protestant world in darkness as well. And brother, let's see, I, I've got four minutes left to go. i tell you what I think I better do. Let's see, let me stop this. Let me see if I can advance it to the section where Mr. Armstrong mentions his telephone call with Billy Graham. I'll let you see it, and we'll play it. All right, oh, okay, I got that Mission to Philadelphia Church in there twice, I guess. All right, well, let me scoot it down to the next sermon. April 1983, Spiritual Health Checkup. All right, he mentions Billy Graham in that one, but that's not the one where he mentions the phone call. Success Based on God's Law, July 30, 1983, he mentioned Billy Graham in that one. You know, it makes a contrast to the truth. Now, Billy Graham says, I preach this, and Mr. Armstrong saying, I just preach this, making reference to Billy Graham to our own church, you people that I see here. I don't want to say these things like this to the public. I, I don't want to say this that might be construed against someone like Billy Graham. Maybe Billy Graham is entirely sincere and believes what he's doing. I'm not his judge, and I'm thankful I'm not, so I don't judge him one way or the other. But he says, whosoever will may come, just come up and confess Christ tonight. Jesus said, now do you think this is true, or do you think Jesus lied? Maybe Jesus didn't know what he was talking about. Jesus said this. Here it is. No man can come to me. Billy Graham says, come on to Christ tonight. Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father which sent me draw him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. And that reference to last day in the, in the Greek is as kathos hemera, uh, the last day, meaning these latter days, these end time days just when Christ returns in the last days and resurrects those called to the spring harvest, John 6, 44. Uh, here it is from the sermon Times and Season. This contains the mention of the telephone call between Billy Graham and, and Mr. Armstrong, March 15, 1980. Now, it just happened that on the... I'm going to show you this text, and then we'll have Mr. Armstrong speaking it. Now, it just happened that on the Wednesday night, before I had listened to a Billy Graham program on television, and perhaps some of you saw that same television program, it was a Billy Graham crusade in Halifax, I believe Nova Scotia, and it gave me something to think about that I thought would trigger a message that I would bring you. Now, Dr. Graham, as they often call him, and I addressed, and as I addressed him, the one time I did talk to him, 
The only time I ever talked to him direct was in England, and it was a telephone conversation, and the managing director of the great Harrods store there in London was one of the pillars of the church leaders that were sponsoring a Billy Graham crusade. Well, it happened at that time that we at Ambassador College there were the chief customer of the Harrods store, and they were buying everything for the college through them, and even through some and, and even through some construction and building, through their construction and builders as well as, as some all kinds of retail goods. And you can even buy animals off them, horses. And I bought a pony for a grandson of mine off Herod's store. But the manager of the Herod's thought it would be good for Billy Graham to talk to me. So he got me on the telephone. He called me Dr. Armstrong, and I called him Dr. Graham. Anyway, he was telling me that he hoped I would never forsake my prophecy ministry. He said, your ministry is prophecy, and that's a very needful ministry. Well, he looked at it that way. Uh, he, well, he look, well, he looked at it that one man has this ministry and that ministry, and we don't look at it. And we don't look at it that way. You know that. But Billy Graham that night was speaking of the signs of the times, and he spoke to quite an extent from Jesus' prophecy in Matthew 24. Now I'll show you his sermon outline. It began with Matthew 16. All right, Brenner, I got I got a bail out of it right there, and let me uh, let me back that up a little bit, and we'll go to Mr. Armstrong's. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Armstrong's saying these words. Uh, well, let's see what happened. I lost my place here. All right, we're, I'm just going to pop it over here. Now I have to do this. Let me come all the way out because. What I have to do is go to a funny screen. Yeah, and I'll have to switch Mr. Armstrong off there to get to the one. Here's, and I may I may have two or three little excerpts, and I may have to go through those till we get to where Mr. Armstrong talks about the telephone conversation that I just read to you, what he said. Here. Well, in all of this, I had not intended to say a word. I just got started. And the first thing you know, I can go on and talk for the next several hours, and I had a message prepared I wanted to bring you. And it's going to take me about three hours, so I may keep you here a long time. Now, it just happened that on the uh, Wednesday night before, I had listened to a Billy Graham program on television, and perhaps some of you saw that same television. It was uh, a Billy Graham uh, crusade in uh, Halifax, I believe, Nova Scotia. And uh, it gave me something to think about that I thought it would trigger a message that I would bring you. Now, Dr. Graham, as they often call him, and as I addressed him the one time I did talk to him, the only time I ever talked to him direct was in England, and it was a telephone conversation, and uh, the managing director of the great Herod store there was one of the pillars of the church leaders that was sponsoring a Billy Graham crusade. Well, it happened at that time that uh, we were the Ambassador College there with the chief customer of the Herod store, and we were buying everything for the college through them, and even through uh, some construction and building. They their constructors and builders, as well as selling all kinds of retail goods. And you can even buy animals of them, horses. And uh, I bought... Uh, uh, a pony for a grandson of mine of Herod's store. But uh, the manager of Herod's thought uh, it would be good to have Billy Graham talk to me, so he got me on the telephone. He called me Dr. Armstrong, and I called him Dr. Graham. And anyway, he was telling me that uh, he hoped I would uh, never forsake my prophecy ministry. He says, your ministry is prophecy, and uh, that is uh, a very needful ministry. Well, he looked at it that one man has this ministry and that, that ministry, and we don't look at it that way. You know that. All right, brethren, and that's where we, that, that, that's the quote there from Mr. Armstrong on that. And uh, i got to sign us on out of here. Uh, thank you for joining me for this Sabbath day, uh, the ninth day of the twelfth month on God's holy sacred calendar. And uh, that means we're just a little more than a month away from Passover Memorial Night after sunset, the 14th of the first month. I want to wish you uh, on this 24th day of February 2018 on the Pagan Roman calendar, I want to wish you a happy rest of the Sabbath. Thank you for joining me this morning, a.m. to the U.S., p.m. to the U.K., 
and God willing, Creek Don't Rise will be back on, and we hopefully I'll have our WorldWatch.tv signal live stream working, so we're not just on Facebook Live, but we we will have this in the archive. We're not on Sabbath.tv today because our streaming service made some changes, so hopefully those of you who would normally tune in via Sabbath.tv will find the archive of this, and uh, I'm sorry we weren't able to do the live stream today, but we do, did make the live stream on Facebook Live Sabbath service page. i got to sign off, brethren. Happy Sabbath. Catch you next. Stephen Lagoli Gilbert saying, catch you next time. Happy Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>